Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fifth season, we are looking at Joe Johnston's 2011 film, Captain America, The First Avenger. I'm Andy Nelson from the Next Real Film Podcast. Pete is still out sick. Fingers crossed he will be back next week. Today, we're talking about Minute 42, uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which begins with Heinz taking a shot at Steve and ends with a nasty cod swimming away. Joining us on the show today is the team from the Timeline Scavengers podcast, Colin Parker Hello. and James Anderson. Hello. Hello. Uh, or I should say, guten tag. Oh. Oh. Uh, bless you. Yeah. Guten tag. All my 170 plus days of Duolingo German are failing me. So, hey, how's it going? Not helping. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are starting this minute at the Riverside Docks and uh, Kruger, Heinz Kruger, is shooting at Steve. He takes a shot uh, right out of the gate, uh, shooting at Steve, who, uh, again, those reflexes, I mean, he doesn't have to do much. He just kind right. of uh, just kind of ducks is really what Steve does, which right. apparently was enough. Right. Yeah. yeah. Either Kruger's a bad shot. I mean, he did just go through a car roll. But, right. um, yeah, right. somehow. <laughs> well, speaking of reflexes, uh, <laughs> I've realized that my joke reflexes aren't as good. The second we move past the Guten Talk thing, I thought of a better one, which was I just wanted to. So I want to take that. I want to do like a second take if I can. OK, so good. Good talk. Oh, no, thank you. I'm good and free. <clears throat> and then what was the better one? So anyway, Andy, thank you so much for having <laughs> yes. us. I'm so sorry <laughs> we had to leave this podcast so quickly, uh, or at least that James does. Uh, how do I boot someone from a Zoom call that's not mine? Uh, right. Uh, hmm. where, where is that button? Hmm. All right. So uh, so yes, we're outside of the Riverside Docks at the pier parking lot. Uh, we do turn around as we see uh, Kruger running and find out there's a tour bus there. Uh, for Lady Liberty tours, and it's uh, the the Pier Thirteen sign standing here. Uh, so let's chat a little bit about this location and uh, kind of this whole action that we have out here before we head out to the pier. There's also another sign uh, in this location. Yes, the billboard. The, there's a billboard, uh, which is great because it has a friend of our show, FDR, on it. Um, and <laughs> friend of the podcast, there's yeah, friend of the podcast. Um, that's what the F and FDR stands for friend of the podcast. Um, and, uh, what I do appreciate though, is that there's also a little bit of very subtle, uh, foreshadowing because the sign with him on it mentions the USO tour. It sure does. Uh, and so this it is sure already letting you know that the president is going to call on Captain America to make that journey. But first he needs to go, you know, save this pier. USO tour featuring and it's just a it's just like a star mm -hmm. cut out and there's no one there right. yet. And Steve <laughs> like walks into it and he's like Now he can actually like be seen. His his head's not too short for it. Now he's fully in frame. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Wow, what yeah. a callback. Wouldn't that have been great? Yeah. <laughs> no, it does say USO deserves the support of every individual citizen. It's a it's a very um I, you know, this is the sort of stuff I mean, geez, or just in last minute we saw a giant poster on the wall for war bonds. Right. I mean, because this is the time where the country was really calling on its citizens to support it in the time of this big oh, for uh, sure. world war. Every yeah, bond yeah. you buy is a bullet in your best guy's gun. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good job, Timmy. There, nice work, nice Timmy. Work. Timmy. <laughs> there, were, there were so many uh, fantastic posters uh, also hanging up like at the enlistment center. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just yeah. it's amazing the uh, the art that was created it, to kind of support all this. It's uh, it's kind of cool. It, it's hard not to not to look at this and, and, and be like, is this something that is they just super propaganded like super successfully? Yes. Or was there like good reasons for like yes i go yeah i guess the answer is yes both yeah it's it's both okay <laughs> no less does uh we we have uh so let's talk about the pier so we're going to the pier right this we're we're at the front of this pier this location i actually thought it was pretty interesting um it is the pier 13 gates were filmed again remember this film was largely filmed uh in england in in the uk uh, the pier 13 gates they were at there. You can see that on either side, there are these big, they call them the chess columns there. They look like rooks really is kind of what, what they look like. And it is uh, outside the Titanic hotel in Liverpool. And we'll actually see the Titanic hotel when we get out to the pier, it's going to be kind of across the water from, from where we're oh, not in the water, not well, 
or under it rather. No, it's not. It's the unsinkable hotel. It's never that thing's never going to sink. <laughs> It'll never sink. It will never sink. That's right. So that's where we are. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, it's again meant to be Brooklyn, but you know they do a good job. We've got the little CG Brooklyn Bridge that you can kind of see uh, poking over the wall there, and so you know. In the, in the scope of everything, it works. And again, we have this bus tour line uh, for Lady Liberty Tours uh, with a whole bunch of uh, tourists. Again, the vast majority of these people, I cannot tell you who they are. Uh, we do have a kid and we do have his mom. Theoretically, there is a tour guide here. And I will tell you that the person who is the Brooklyn tour guide credited himself on IMDb as the Brooklyn tour guide. And that's Steve Layton. Is he the bus driver? Maybe. I don't know who else would be is a Brooklyn it, tour guide. Is it the person that grabs the woman and pulls her back? Like the mom? Who grabs the woman? It's just a guy who grabs. Yeah, I don't know who. There is a woman who credited herself as 1930s citizen. Uh, her name is Vera Horton. I, when I looked at her picture on IMDb, I'm like, you know, she could be the mom. Weirdly, the mom isn't credited as somebody who, you know, seems like would be credited. I mean, I'm assuming all the lines that she's screaming for her son are all just 80 yard later that she didn't actually get to say anything. So she probably was just a background actor. So I'm thinking maybe that's her and she just didn't know what decade uh, the story actually yeah. took place. She actually her character stopped being a citizen in 1939. Right. Um, she was on the run. Yeah. 1930s citizen but she wasn't know. after that she was just a criminal it's like i'm a 90s kid yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right yeah exactly yeah yeah uh, but the person that we do have that is credited is of course boy at doc this is young maxwell newman not old maxwell newman not old Maxwell Newman. That's a totally different uh, person on IMDb. Uh, little Maxwell uh, has got a little uh, spunk, I would say. Yeah. He's, mm -hmm. he's not mm -hmm. going to take any guff when old Kruger decides, you know what, I'm going to take this kid as a hostage. He is kicking and screaming. And I don't know. What do you think of our little, uh, our little redhead here? I mean, he can swim. That's the good news. Do you know the movie Curly Sue? Anyone? Some oh, Curly Sue was a John Jim Hughes Belushi movie. movie. John, I believe it was John Hughes. Yeah. This this little kid is really brassy. She's a young girl, and she's really brassy. She's a thief or something. Mm -hmm. But you kind of get the feeling that it's like, so you just say whatever. To, like you have, you know, like it's like Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone, another John Hughes movie. Right. Or, wow, there's a character in each John Hughes movie. So John Hughes himself probably just mouths off all the time. I'm like, kid, he has a gun. I mean, like. I guess, you know, the folly of youth or whatever, but like... Yeah, because also it's 1943, so we haven't gone through the process of teaching young Americans what to do in an active shooter situation yet. Um, that's not going to be until like the 90s and 2000s. Well, yeah, that's a dark, a dark twist of this. Yes. <laughs> well, and, uh, listen, <laughs> uh, that's not a joke. That is an actual statement. We are teaching them how to swim, though. Yes, we are teaching them how to that swim. Is, it, is a, it is the sad truth. It's the, sad, the truth. sad truth. I'm like, yes. that's I, I wish I didn't have to say that, but that's where we're at. Um, maybe also proving that this is in London, not in uh, in America, yeah. right? Yeah. The kid's like, I'm going to kick. Is this an active Because sh an active shooter is a guy with a gun, and that's it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like in an enclosed space. We don't need to get into it. It's not. It's fine. Yeah. No. Um, no, no sorry. <laughs> I. You know, listen. I. I'll, you know what? Let me just. Okay. I rewinded it, and I'm just gonna say, yeah, this kid's got a lot of spunk, and I appreciate that he is also kind of a hero in his own right in this moment because he's like, no, I don't need some Captain's America to come save me. I've got my own back. Right. And his, I can swim. No, you can't. Yeah. His mom yells from He's the like, bus. It just, he can like, stop pal. saying that. He's like, <laughs> I assume I can swim. We never come back to him. It, it is funny. I will. We'll, hmm. Let's we'll come back point. to him in the water. But yeah, I, I, I do want to talk about that a little bit. But I mean, but he's a very spunky kid uh, that that Kruger uses basically as a human shield while he continues shooting at Steve. I mean, he you know, we saw him shoot. Four times, I think it was in the car. Right away here, he shoots a fifth time as soon as he gets out. And we didn't even talk about this. This is Shield Mark, Mark II we have here, right? We have Steve mm -hmm. picks up the door. Absolutely. Again, this Lucky Star Cab uh, company, their, 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 uh, their logo looks, it, I mean, it's looked very familiar since we first saw it. And now we know why, because Steve picks it up. And of course, it is a, a perfect representation of his Shield Yet again. Because Lucky Star was made up for the MCU. It's not an actual, like, 1940s cab company. 
Um, so they definitely specifically did this just literally for this shot, which is, I mean, it's a great shot. For the gag, yeah. It's a yeah. good shot. Yeah. Works really nicely. Plus good Madonna tribute. <laughs> you know that song, Lucky Star? Yeah. James uh, yes. Toot two in yes. one episode? Okay. Listen, Curly Sue is as low as I think I'm going to go, so I think everything's all up here. For <laughs> I'll me. always take a Madonna reference. That's that that one's <laughs> a okay with me. Okay, I've been I've been. You are a true mind. blue fan, there, Andy. <laughs> uh, we, you and I can go to my La Isla Bonita and, and hang out a little bit. I like that. <laughs> That's like a prayer come true. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Song we've titles. we've got so all right, bullets. I don't know the 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 Walther uh, P uh, thirty eight, I believe is what he's using here. We five, six and seven go into the door of the lucky star, and then he shoots uh three more times, I believe. At various points, as he backs up and Steve kind of keeps creeping up on him. Right. Um, so that's that's like nine bullets at least that this has had, assuming that he reloaded it when he was um, in the car the first time. I don't know if he's really had time to do any reloading. So then we'd also have to take into account. I think he just has multiple guns. Uh, you think he just walks around with a, you know, a Walther in each pocket? I mean, he has like 12 lighters. You know what I mean? So, like, why not? I, I think that's all the same lighter. You think, okay, we're going to get to yeah, the lighter. Yeah, we'll get to, we'll get to we'll the lighter. Save, <laughs> save that conversation. But I, save it for yeah, lighter. We, save it for lighter. But, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I, he doesn't seem to have any kind of holster. But, like, I also imagine that, like, you know, perhaps if you have, you know, one in, like, a waistband, one in, like, a, like, the little thing, like, the little side slider holster that you, like, put on, like, if you're a detective. You know what I mean? Um, like, that, that you would go under your coat. Perhaps. Yeah, like he might have one on an ankle holster too, for all we know. Oh, I mean yeah, he could have point. multiple. Yeah, yeah. Like like on a wrist on a wrist uh oh, like the little spring mechanism that pops it out. Yeah. It yeah. could also be in the glove yeah. compartment of the car. Uh it could have been on his compatriot. <laughs> of the, of the so you think he stole this particular one from the cab driver. No, no, sorry. I mean the in the other car when he was, when he was with his <laughs> no, friend. So, hold on, hold on, yeah. hold on. But that would be very that's, funny. That, that's my head cannon. That's also very New York. Is that it was not his He's he's like, yeah. God, I love this country. Like, yeah, you know, the up. cab driver just had yeah. a gun on the passenger yeah. front seat. It was just, just laying like, there. Yeah. All right, it's Betsy, like we got in, another fair. Like right underneath a folded newspaper and he's like, perfect. Yeah, exactly. Mets win. <laughs> That's you know, this this is the no prize for for the number of bullets. But even then, okay, if this is the same gun, it still shoots at least nine bullets here. So we still have to kind of ponder that a little bit. All right. But we get to this point. They keep moving backwards and backwards to the point where they're farther down the pier at the point where they're at the water. He holds the gun to the kid's head. Steve, th that's when Steve comes out. And this is, I suppose, that moment of like jumping on the grenade. He's like, right. it's almost like that self-sacrifice. Wait, don't shoot him. Shoot me. But the kid's the grenade. <laughs> but the kid, the kid is the grenade here. Like, exactly. All right. The kid. All right. You have a OK. That guy has a gun to that kid's head. I better move fast and be loud. All of a sudden, right now, like, come on, man! The kid is the kid is Hodge in this moment, and the gun is the grenade because he's trying to save Hodge and friends from from the explosion, from the blast. So then, who's Kruger in this? Is is Kruger Phillips? Yes. <laughs> so Kruger's who's... Phillips. Wait a minute. Boom. That would be like if Steve, if Phillips threw the grenade and Steve kicked it at Hodge, and thank God it was a dummy. No, 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 because he because he has the gun on the kid's head, but like I think he clearly knows that if he presents himself, he's going to change his because like he does. The second he comes out, the gun goes to to Rogers. Then it goes back to the kid for a second, but then he you know clicks. I don't think that you should place your bet on. This guy has a gun to this kid's head. I'm going to jump out at like him. Like it's like a bear. And hope that he moves the gun, not the trigger, right. but the whole gun. Where you're like, hey, bear. Whoa. Right. That's, yeah, because, well, okay, I get it in context of Steve forgetting that he is now a super soldier. But in the context of Steve thinking his brain is still like, I'm this scrawny little guy. I'm going to go and 
and save this kid by by swapping myself out for the kid. Like that's I would think his kind of mentality here, right? He's going to say, "Take me, don't hurt that kid." Um but he's also forgetting about the fact that he is a super soldier and he is forgetting that Kruger up to this point has seen him running really fast, jumping from car to car like a superhuman and uh, basically doing things that no one should do. And this also begs the question, well, I, I suppose not, because in the flashback, there is a flashback that uh, that Erskine uh, has remembering that Kruger had a gun when he was there doing the experiment with Schmidt. So technically, uh, this is at least one of the people who knows what the super soldier serum right, can, can do, do and that it can it can turn somebody into some somebody incredibly strong. So he if not more than anybody would know that uh, Steve has incredible strength and could defeat him if, uh, you know, in a, in a hostage swap situation. You could also easily come around that corner going, listen, I know what you're thinking. Did you shoot eight or nine times? But the answer is it's more <laughs> bullets than your gun can actually carry. So we're actually cool here. Oh, I thought you were. I thought you were going to uh, just jumping around that corner. Like I'm feeling lucky, punk. You know. That's what um, I was going to say. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. forgot that line. Sorry. And then it turns out that Kruger's a mutant that can create bullets. Right. That's and his put them Directly yeah. into the gun. And oops. He's like the the that's, the, a, that's a dead. What kid. was the Terminator in the Terminator Three that could turn into machines and bullets? And I stuff. think that was like a T three thousand. Yeah. If I, yeah. It, well, that was the woman. Yeah. The, right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I want to say because the T one thousand could not do complicated machinery, but she could. Correct. He could. So. He could only ask if people had seen this boy. Right. So <laughs> that was his primary. <laughs> so if, if he, the question is, does Steve know if this is a T one thousand or T three thousand? And I, I think right. that he does. He was that to, part of basic training? Yeah. Uh, Tommy is... Lee Jones, listen. Here's what you're going to need to know. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a T one thousand. Tommy Lee Jones is Tommy Lee Jones is just standing there saying, "I don't care." <laughs> yeah, just shoot. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We are, Fling those huge metal balls at him. We are deep in reference <laughs> land here. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's there are plenty of things to use that he could do, but again, Steve doesn't know what he can do, and I think we have to keep remembering that. It's like remember he hasn't he hasn't gazed at himself yet. Yeah, that's right. true. That's true. <laughs> don't worry, that's coming up. But when yeah, coming, when the yes. bullet hits one of those metal balls and it that is one of the like i know i shouldn't be going oh satisfying but the little like the sound oh, that it makes yeah. excellent excellent foley work i mean it was incredible Absolutely. i was like oh oh that's a good sound that was that was nice i like that a lot yeah because i think the, the he hits he hits like the wall right the first time and then like i don't know metal beam or something but then it's that ball that big ball and it's just like yeah it's, a, it's that nice deep boom yeah, you, that's the one where like I like to see the foley artist doing the sound because I'm like, there's no way you didn't just throw like a something at a big metal right. ball, and they're like, actually, what I used was this small pot and a uh, you know a, a a bell or something. I'm like, a natural oh, bullet. Okay, no. that I stand corrected. Great job, underrated artists. Yeah, absolutely. They do they do amazing amazing work, and it's always fun to see those videos of them actually creating those things so that was one of the most fun things i ever did in um school that so i was my minor was for uh, digital filmmaking and we got to for um uh it's called i think it's called tv and no audio and tv and film sorry uh in that class we got to go to a sound stage and we got to do a bunch of foley stuff and I did enjoy like, you know, like the clothing and like moving stuff or like, you know, knocking into things. The the footprint thing, like like walking on different yeah. surfaces is again just like the oddly satisfying to do. Like just hearing the crunch of shoes on like different types of sand <laughs> or or grass. Great work. Great stuff. They are they are fun. They are fun to do. Yeah. Think of all the barefoot work they got to do of Steve running. Oh. Through all the yeah, the city. absolutely yeah, very fun because it's also the wet, I'm, I'm the wet streets. You know they don't they uh, uh, they had the water trucks spraying everything. So yeah, that nice kind of wet barefoot sound. That's always nice. It's a very satisfying sound. Chicken thighs smacking onto concrete. There's a there's a part of Agent Carter season one I think where they are filming a radio show, and so there's actually a bunch of foley work that they're that you get like you know oh I'm gonna punch you and they punch this like ham or turkey yeah, or something the, the turkey like yeah. all this stuff and that's to get like a body love like that. Thump. yeah yeah mm, so cool 
to ma- literally get a meaty sound. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it, what it is. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. What if we used meat? <laughs> so, okay. So we all, we are back to the, the conversation at hand though. So we all are a little skeptical about the kind of this, whatever Steve's plans are and the fact that it works, I guess is just luck because mm-hmm. it does seem strange yes. that he presents himself for Kruger and Kruger takes the bait and right. doesn't just try shooting the kid or something or just continue backing up, which is what he's succeeded at the most up to this point. Right. But I think one thing that he has also seen, uh, well, I don't know, has he seen that Steve would, like, care for a kid? Like, why why does he assume that Steve would go for the kid? This is that Spider-Man thing where it's like, what are you going to do, Spider-Man? Are you going to save the girl or are you going to save the busload of passengers or whatever? Both. Um, Right. Yeah, of course, that's what Spider-Man is going to do. But how how does Kruger know? what Steve is going to do here. Why does he assume that Steve will go to the kid and not just charge him? I know it's a little propaganda, but I do think that like part of this is kind of like the idea of the Germans during this war versus the Americans, you know, being like one side cares more for other people, which is not true. We didn't get involved until it came to our doorstep. But, you know, it's like the idea of like, you know, oh, I have to save this life. Versus, like, I'm interested in taking lives. Kruger's also seen Steve Rogers and, like, knows his background. He's been Fred right. Clemson, sort of. True, true. He probably maybe has a file on this and Erskine's theories about he's a good man. All that stuff. So, okay. He also knocked Peggy Carter out of the way of the car so that she didn't get run over. Like, he clearly sees him saving people from getting hurt, so... Well, he's yeah, he's seen that. But I mean, my impression and I guess I'm curious now, do you feel that he had been posing as Fred Clemson for a long time or that the time when he showed up here as Fred Clemson from the State Department, that was the first time anybody had heard of this guy? Because that was my impression. I was under the impression that that this was like, a you know, when uh, Red Skull's like it's already been taken care of or whatever, when he, you know, snakes zola's response one responsibility is that they called you know activated the cell at this at the state department where fred clemson is now gonna like break cover and do his assassination huh right i i imagine he's been in place for a while because i also think that you wouldn't get invited if you were literally just showing up out of nowhere I think that, like, you have to have a cover, you have to have a story, you have, like, because the other thing is that, you know, they are saying, like, okay, we now know where they are, like, go after them. But I also imagine that when he first defects, they probably sent people after him who have been looking for him for a bit. And it's probably like, okay, we now have the information, you know, and then that's when he's like, shall I give the order? It has already been given. Yeah. Plus, there's that whole fifth column thing that the old Captain America comics were, like, super like into which is like there are nazis among us all over the place and we just don't know like it kind of has that feeling of like he was embedded there who knows who's embedded elsewhere sort of like paranoia to it um too so that that, that's what i've always assumed i i would just as easily like that he came to america that you know earlier that day wait a minute now that i'm saying this i feel like there's something on the mc wiki that's like so you know, Heinz Kruger arrives and gets his pay, gets his new identity from from the you know another Hydra agent in the State Department. Is it possible that 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 Fred Clemson was actually a person, and they did the whole uh, Zemo thing of like you know icing him and then taking over this guy's identity? Because like the fact Maybe. that they're like, Maybe. well, I want to know is how did a Hydra agent get like a dry a ride over in your car, right? does also imply that he also like the name or at least the person somehow wasn't just like a, you know, like he's not going, Oh, does anyone go into the thing today that I could get a ride with? And they're like, Oh God, I don't even know this guy. This is going to be awkward. You know I mean? It's like, <laughs> it feels like there has to be some sort of precedent there for him to just show up in that car. Yeah. It, the, yeah the whole thing is, I mean, I, I'm looking at the wiki right now and it does seem like he had just been posing as Fred Clemson for a time in the Department of State. The thing that made me skeptical about that is that when the senator, when Senator Brandt introduces him, like he can't even remember his name. He's like, oh, this is Clem something. 
Right. And so I'm like, okay, so this is the first time these people are ever seeing this person coming from the State Department, which made me feel like, oh, okay, so this is kind of a new a, a new thing for him to be uh, posing as, and and likely someone else kind of got him in as this. But um, but I, I do like the idea that hello, he had, I'm regular white right, man, yeah, yeah a regular. <laughs> but I do like the idea that he had been in the uh, State Department as a while, wor- uh, for a while, working as um, kind of a Hydra agent in there. So I, I can see it going either way. Brandt's aide definitely knows his name, but Brandt himself doesn't. I mean, I think of that to me like that makes sense too. Of like a senator being like, uh. Uh, oh god someone sure. i have to know someone's name oh uh, gosh yeah but brand is like with the rolodex behind him sir that's uh fred clemson he's like uh, uh fred clemson yeah yeah that's that's it it's that guy on on veep that's always he's also on arrest development tony hill what tony hill yeah yeah where he's like like just whispering in her ear this is so and so blah, blah, blah. yeah like that role <laughs> love that role. Yeah, right exactly okay. exactly um let no mm-hmm. need for a name on that guy though on the aid because <laughs> like he is He's just aid. Brant's um, aid. Yeah, just like exactly. Kruger's, Kruger's um, aid and Kruger's driver. We don't need their right. names. <laughs> right. We don't right. need no yeah. stinking names. There's a certain level where we don't care. Right. Yeah, you know, get some raises and then we'll give you a name. Yeah. All right. Um, oh, go there, ahead. Did you have something else? There's something where, like, all of a sudden this guy who's in this, like, cookout. I don't remember where this was, what movie or show this was in. But all of a sudden he's, like... Like he turns around and sees someone who's at his cookout and she recognized him from the from being a Nazi hunters. It's called hunters. Yeah. Yeah. With Al Pacino. And uh, it like that. That's sort of what I think of when I think of like this fifth column sort of uh, Heinz Kruger long undercover is that he is like embedding himself in suburban America sort of deal where it's like. Right. He is people's friend. He is like going to Rotary Club stuff. I guess the thing, and I know our time with him is very short, um, but I, sure. I guess I do kind of wish that if that was what they were going to do, like he had been infiltrated in the State Department for a long time, like if it felt more buddy buddy up in the up in the room. And I guess they had to walk that line about how like how much do we want to feel like Hydra has been in you know in the state department as spies for a long period of time this isn't the film that's exploring how deep hydra goes right, this that's is the just next one. right we just need this guy to kill this doctor that's it right you know well and he's so awkward and and weird and you're like yeah state department am i right and they're like ah no spy <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> heartless killer right the other the even, other even option. when you're smiling it looks creepy sorry dude yeah exactly yeah. Fred Clemson, nice to meet you. Uh, and he throws the kid into the drink. So uh, let's talk. Yes. This is, of course, the East River. Uh, you know, I mean, it, we're, I know we're in England, but still, that's that's ideally where he's throwing the kid into. Uh, way east. Uh, yeah, way east. Let's talk <laughs> a little bit about uh, the kid in the water. Um, I, mm-hmm. I know this is uh, a favorite of yours, throwing yeah. kids in, in water. <laughs> For a time before the le- it got incredibly popular and people started checking out the novelization ahead of me, I was reading along in the junior novelization of Captain America, the first Avenger. And I think the most fascinating thing that I have come across is this moment. So I, if I re- it's two lines, uh, three lines, two lines. Go get him, the boy shouted, interrupting Steve's, interrupting Steve's thoughts. I can swim. Great, Steve muttered, more to himself than the kid. I can't. Yep. And that fascinates me. That sets my imagination. Because then he does a perfect die. I see why they cut that part. Because it's like, oh, you can't. Interesting. Because you just dove better than. Not just the Olympics. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Lucky shot, I guess. It was, but, it was uh, scripted that way, too. And I guess they just chose to uh, to not go that route, which is it is very interesting that they they chose to kind of. Uh, I mean, I guess it makes sense in context of what our expectations of Steve are. We've seen him when he was at Camp Lehigh. We know he's not that great at these things. And so when it comes to swimming, yeah, I guess it makes sense that, you know, he probably doesn't know the first thing about what to do in the water. If you if it was like, great, I can't pause, pause. At least I don't think I can. That would be interesting to me. Like you sort of see him being like, I also didn't think I could do the. Super jumpy, but I did do the super jumpy, so maybe I can. It's literal sink or swim. Perfect dive or uh, perfect die. Oh, okay. Wow, I see what you did there. Well, we're not really going to get to that quite yet. Uh, We're going to have to talk more about can Steve swim or not uh, next time. Uh, Today, we're just finding out that, you know, we, we have that moment, though, where he 
does have that conversation with the boy, which for me feels like the most like New York City American uh, golly gosh, American pie, yeah. Spider-Man sort of thing mm-hmm. that we could have ever had in this film when he looks down at the kid and, and he's just like, go get him. I can swim. Like it's it's just adorable to like almost an extreme. And I'm swimming here. It's t- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> More, more brat, just brassy to everyone. Just like, oh, what are you looking at? <laughs> Go get him! Don't. What's funny is like, <laughs> like, it, like we never come back to this kid. And yes, he can swim, but like, I would love to come back, like in a what if or something, and follow this kid. Like, there's actually no ladder for him to yeah. climb out. How like far does this kid actually right. have to swim so that he can get out of this place? Yeah, and and that uh, that little boy became uh, Namor, <laughs> right? <laughs> That little boy was Namor in disguise. He pulls off the things. Oh, I can swim. Winks at the camera. Just you wait. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Pulls his shoes off with his ankle yeah. wings. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. So so the boy can swim. The boy takes off and sends Steve on his way. Steve runs down the dock. Kruger, meanwhile, uh, has pushed. Now, okay, let's talk about lighters. Let's talk lighters. My impression is that it's always the same lighter, but is he hitting the same button? Does he have different buttons? Does it work if he pushes a button in a different way and it does a certain thing? That has always been my impression. You kind of broke my brain a little bit just now, and it, you made it sound like he's got a lighter for every every situation, like the lighter for the, the cigarette <laughs> uh, case bomb, the lighter right. for the car bomb. Now he has the lighter for uh, uh, raising the hydro submarine from the bottom of the river. It makes more sense that it's like press one for that bomb, two for that one, three for raise the submarine. But if I was his cue, I would give him uh, a whole case right. of lighters and be like, all right, you have to pair these up individually with the things you want to activate. And here's, here's the instructions on how to do that. How does he know which one is which? I mean, yeah, I'll- exactly. By feel that that's a good question. Like, what if he pulled? What if he went to detonate the cigarette case and it actually raised the submarine? Right. Well, and that kid gets on but board. Here's, here's the same. Here's the same question, though, in a different way, which is that, like, because every time they show it, it is just straight this, right? So there seems to be only one button, right? Like, they, they, there's no like him like dialing something and then pressing. It's just flick, click, right? So to me, like, what if you, you know, flick and click and it blows up the one outside instead of the one inside. Right. So, like, how do you know which one you're going to first? Like, is there some sort of dial proximity is I mean, it could be proximity. It's Hydra technology on the level of like uh, of Stark, where it's all like the super subtle motions, like which way do you move your hand so that you're flying the right way? You know, and it's just like I know that if I click but my thumb is very slightly on the left side of the button, it's going to do this bomb. And if my thumb is on this side of the button, it's going to blow that bomb. And if I push it, if I do it, if I push the all the way down, that's going to raise the submarine. Where's our training montage? I mean, it could also be almost like a list almost like two of like, you could also select it. So it's like, with the first click does this, the second click does that, the third click does this. Um, yeah. I mean, he does somehow have the perfect amount of clicks to be where he wants to be. Or or is it a proximity thing? Maybe it's like whatever you're closest to. Like, I'm closest to the cigarette bomb. That's the one that's going to go. Now I'm closest to the car. It's yeah. just surprising that he didn't blow anything else up between the outside and the, the river. And like, it's also very strange because it's like, I don't know. I understand that he's running away to get to that location, but like because Steve is chasing him and all this other stuff, I I feel like I would have tried to lose the guy first, you know, instead of going directly to my exit strategy. Exactly. It's I don't know. It's there's there's enough weirdness there where I'm kind of like he he only had I guess at, at maximum he had three lighters. Well, no, I mean that's all that's all he activated. That was my other question is like, do, how many other bombs does he have planted around the city right. as possible escape route just in case he needs to blow something else up? Can he blow up the submarine? Plus unlocking his home door. Yeah. Uh, checking his messages, like all these things. Yeah. Have you ever tried to unlock your, your house and you're like, huh, click, click. And then, oh, and then you hear behind you in the bay. Poof, <laughs> <you're> like, <sighs> exactly. Dang no, it. Wait. No. Oh. 
I, I forgot. Uh, I was out two clicks, and then it's it's like it's like learning Morse code. Yeah. You have to go. Is it is it long yeah. click, short click, short click, long click, or was it short click, long click, short click? Wait, I just wait. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> exactly. If we're if he has multiple lighters, and on the side of the lighter there's like dots or braille or some sort of marking that he knows. You know, three dots. He's because, like, you could train yourself for. I know that that's a pocket full of lighters, and that's silly. <laughs> but there would be a way that you wouldn't have to look and see that you've pulled out the green lighter to make sure that you're going to blow up the right thing or whatever. You could have well, like if you, had, you, know, if, you, if, you if they were all green lighters, then you would have a pocket full of kryptonite. <laughs> that's true, and 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 that uh, puts a, a weird spin on it. And I think that that no wait, pocket full, yeah, that's right. Spin doctors, yeah, there you yeah. go, yep. Right? Yeah. Full yeah. I think so. Anyways, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I okay. Well, I I do wonder if they are if it is multiple lighters. How many additional lighters does he actually have in his pocket? And I know we'll never find out, but it does make me wonder. That's one of the like deleted how, scenes is where they they just like they you know he, he's on the ground. Sorry, <laughs> spoiler alert. And he starts going through his pockets, and he goes, "What the?" And it's like a magician, you know, like when they keep pulling out handkerchiefs. It's just like one, two, three. Yeah. What? How many? <laughs> how many are there? He just keeps throwing them out, and there's like twenty on the ground. His tooth. Actually, doesn't have anything reactive in it until he presses that that fourth lighter. There's a li- another lighter that in we his don't hand. see him. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly. I would love to have seen that. Like he has to push one lighter to actually pop the tooth out, and then he has to right. actually push another lighter. He doesn't actually bite the cyanide capsule. It's it's a whole thing. Yeah, it's like a release I thing. Like yeah, we're, we're we're getting ahead of ourselves. This is all later. Right now, we're still that's a tease. Yeah, we're that's just a tease for what's what's to come. Right now, he we we know he uses this lighter, and it raises the Hydra submarine. Let's talk about the Hydra submarine, which is also known as the Pfizer Dorch. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that translates from German to nasty cod, which I think is very funny that they, they chose to name it that. I don't know why, but it just cracks me up. The, the nasty cod. What do you two think of this submarine? It looks great, but it does straight up look like they just took the wheels off of one of the Batmobiles from, I think, maybe one of the Tim Burton movies. I'm trying to remember which, which, <laughs> which car I'm thinking of, because there's been multiple Batmobiles. But it straight up just looks like they took the wheels off and then put it in the water, which is fine. Or it's but... an SR-71, but it's a boat. Yeah, I never thought of that until you said that, but it, uh, I do see that. I do see the result. Like it's like a Blackbird. Yeah. They have very similar... like. Because the Batmobiles, especially in like the Tim Burton one, have like a very specific, like long front to him. Right. With the like the turbine right in the center. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The very first time I saw that, I was like, huh. Like, the ages Remember, ago. in Batman Returns, he had the plane that turned into the boat. So that that's actually pretty close. I mean, I know that shape wise, it's not right, but like function wise, it's pretty. If it, instead of going in underwater, if it raised up, he gets in there and goes. <laughs> <laughs> like a biplane just takes off. It does sound like a Jetsons car for sure. That's uh yeah, excellent. It is funny because looking through the like the the art of Captain America book, like it's amazing how many pages they have of the designs specifically for this submarine. Like more than a lot of these other vehicles. Like it was page after page. I'm like, oh my god, goodness! We see it very briefly, but they spent so much time on the design and and trying to come up with all the specifics for it. It's very funny if they never even really realized that they basically were just redesigning the Batmobile in the process of all of this. It's like the thing where it's like, no, to make it perfectly aerodynamic, it's going to look like that no matter who's designing Perhaps, it yeah. whenever. It's like this is yeah. like, you know, a geodesic dome is a geodesic dome sort of deal. Like, How, Were either of you guys ever like in a band way back in the day, like maybe in high school or something like that? Nope. God, no, Colin. Okay. So like my <laughs> my thought on this as well is there have definitely been times where when I was in a band where I was like writing something, I was like, oh, yeah, this sounds so great. And you're like, you know, you're writing this song like, oh, this is going like, I really like how this is. And like you play it back for someone. They go, wait, hang on. Uh, take take out the vocals for a second. And then like you're you're playing it back and they just start going, if you want something done. Right. And then you're like, oh, it is just right. OK. Yep. It's just uh, two princes by the spin doctors. Okay. Full of kryptonite. It's that Paul yeah. McCartney thing. When Paul McCartney wrote yesterday, he went he dreamed the, the tune and then spent the next day going around everyone like, hey, what's this right. song? Blah, blah, blah. You know, scrambled eggs, which is what he it was originally called. And they're like, no, 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 that's nothing. And he's like, are you kidding? This is going to make me millions of dollars. He didn't say that. But like, you know, it was the opposite where it's like, wow, no one, huh? Um, Fieser Dorsch 
uh, when in German is uh, I E is you say the E. So oh, it's Fieser Dorsch. Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Fieser, yeah. Fieser Dorsch. That my uh, Duolingo roaring back to to help uh, all of a sudden. Nice, 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 nice. The MCU wiki gives the translation as vicious cod, and I was like, vicious is a weird. Is like the vicious versus nasty is sort of an interesting thing. I, I just did Google Translate is where I usually use my stuff. Yeah, no, I did too. I got nasty cod and Google Translate. Absolutely. So vicious on the MC Wiki was was fascinating to me. Um, I guess nasty, vicious. Yeah, I guess you can see. Yeah, it's a subtle difference, but yeah. Because nasty can like can connote like ugh, but nasty in in vicious terms is like oh like a nasty yeah. fight like oh yeah. he fights nasty right 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 yeah anyways yeah. that's all of this is nothing but it is <laughs> what it's like podcasting with me and i think that that's really the important part. it is the road we go down <laughs> i am so embarrassed by the way that i that i went to do um uh, two princes by the spin doctors and immediately forgot every single set of words so i went if you and I went no way that's from a joke from something else then just had to go dun, totally dun, 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 totally dun, there's a there's a really good podcast out about talking about um, the origins of Who Let the Dogs Out, yeah. which is another one of those songs that they they through the process of that podcast they're tracing. Uh, okay, this person wrote it. Okay, we're, no, they actually heard it and it came from this person. No, no, it came from this person, and it keeps going back and back and back. And is is the most fascinating story mm. listening to kind of like where that song came from. Um, because it's like it, the, nobody realized that it was they had heard something and it just kind of kept going down this thing. It was it was really interesting. There's a, a switch on pop episode similarly about Cotton Eye Joe. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so the Rednecks version it like goes way back, way back to you know probably uh, African American musician right. at some point. But like, um, so it's an actual question yeah. of where did you come from? Right. Where did you go? Exactly. Here, here's how we started. Here's how how we are now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and speaking of, of where do you go, we we have gone to the end of the minute. We have yep. gone past the end of the minute <laughs> good. into uh, all sorts of tangents. Uh, we have Steve running after this submarine that is uh, taken off and it's starting to submerge. That's where we end our minute where, with the nasty cod uh, starting to dip under the water. And uh, will Steve decide to swim or not, I guess, is the question we're left with. Uh, any last thoughts from either of you about this particular minute? When we were doing this uh, bit of uh, the the full scene on our show, I talked about how much I love this scene from start to finish. You know, we still get in some of the, the newer movies, you know, again, the conversation that we had last episode, people kind of like figuring out their powers, figuring out like who they are as they go kind of thing. But like this is using the analogy that I used earlier. This is kind of Steve's literal sink or swim moment uh, throughout the entire scene. Uh, and I I really like the stakes that are throughout it. I understand that the he's a little bit of a bad hostage negotiator in this scene, um, <laughs> but like it is still, I think at all points you kind of everything tracks for who Steve is, uh, and I just I, I really appreciate how this scene plays out um, from from the the taking of the hostage through the kid being thrown in the river. Yeah, it works. It works really well. Were you both fans of Chris Evans before Captain America? Like, did you know him in many films? I'd only seen him in like two or three things. I mean, obviously as the Human Torch, um, and then not another teen movie. That that and that alone for me. He was in like Cellular. He was in the Losers, uh, like bit parts. Right, like there's something in, else. Uh, he was in that Steal the SAT um, movie, wasn't he? The che uh, Cheaters or something? Oh, and then of course, Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Scott Pilgrim, yeah, that's one of the bit parts that he did. Um, I only the perfect score is that only, the one you're talking if about? You'd, mm -hmm. That's it. That's the one. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. and duh, yes, of right. course. Uh, Casey, the voice of Casey in TMNT, the animated, yeah, the the one that was animated, right? Yeah, but yeah, Casey Jones. Yeah, he's also in Sunshine. I don't, did either of you see Sunshine? Um, Danny Boyle's film about the astronauts trying to like throw nuclear bombs into the sun to reignite it. No, oh, that's is that interesting. George Clooney is in that. Fan, it's a it's a fantastic movie. No, no, it's um, it, no. Uh, what I'm it's Killian Murphy, Rose Byrne. It. It's actually a great international cast. Um, Cliff Curtis is in it. Uh, Michelle Yao, uh, Hiroyuki Sanada, Benedict wow. Wong actually talked about it a little. Um, an wow. MCU. We got uh, we got two yeah. Shang Chi people and uh, yeah. nice, excellent. Yeah, 
Well, remind everybody again about your podcast, where they can tune in. Sure. Uh, we are on Timeline Scavengers, which is an MCU podcast where we're going through the entire uh, MCU, including things that uh, people uh, named Kevin have said maybe aren't uh, canon. We are keeping them canon because we like them. Uh, the whole MCU universe uh, in historical order uh basically like if something flashes back to 20 years before we will have seen it 20 years prior um and then we'll catch up to present um it's a fascinating show we've designed it to to last forever and uh we're having a fun time doing it uh we are uh you know doing some captain america as we record this we're sort of knee deep in the in the cap stuff too but then we're gonna move on to some agent carter agents of shield stuff and then well it's so funny 2020 three starts with us finishing up agent carter and ends with us in the middle of captain marvel 2023 is a wild like 50 year run yeah, you're gonna have a lot yeah. of a lot of fun it's gonna be bits in there fun yeah. yeah so yeah come come on over uh the links are in the in the show notes absolutely um, i'm told they they so. sure are yeah uh <laughs> along with a bunch of other links uh from the two of you so check those out uh we'll be back tomorrow with minute 43 so until next time true believers Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Spread the News by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show.